the more I asked her to marry me, the uh, longer time she seemed to want to consider it. <laughs> That's because it took you so darn long to ask her. She's only getting even with you, Brian. Well, Brian, that's very interesting. And then, then uh, what happened then, huh? I, uh... Oh, the uh, whole idea just uh, withered away, I uh, suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can't leave those things lying about in the sun, they do. <laughs> well, that is a very sad story, Brian, even though you don't seem to think so. And did you drop down on one knee every time you proposed to this uh, bit of fluff? Pretty much the same, yes. Uh, you sure it wasn't your knee that withered away? <laughs> she turned you down so many times you began to feel like a bedspread, I presume. Huh? Uh, did, did she ever tell you why she refused you, Brian? No, no, but I uh, learned at uh, sort of long last that uh, she more, thought more of herself than I did. <laughs> I if you get me, is that... Uh, yes, no? I understand. I think the three of you should have been very happy together. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, have you any hobbies of any kind? Oh, not that I'd like to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a cockatoo in a two-up school or something? you have to ask no, me that. I, explain uh, that one later. Tell us. Come on, now. I write poetry. Brian, could we hear a bit? Could we hear a bit of the poetry? <laughs> now, now, come on, give us some of the poetry that you wrote. Oh. Uh, this will be love stuff, I'm sure. Uh, now, a limerick, that's... Uh, a limerick? There was a young lady of Rye. Oh, break it down. <laughs> <laughs> Irene? Yes, Bob. All right, we'll try. Go ahead. There was a young lady. There was a young lady of Ride who ate green apples and died. <laughs> now wait for it. <laughs> the apples fermented inside the lamented and made cider insider inside. <laughs> Good. You know, you'd make a very good pair, you. Don't you think you're a good match, Irene? Yes, Bob. All right, Byron, that settles everything. Yeah. When can you get ready for the ceremony? Uh, huh? Uh, don't uh, rush me into anything. <laughs> discourage you, but you had better get started, old boy. You you have put a lot of time behind you, and if you ever want to bounce a grandchild on your knee, you'd better get moving, old boy. I can see you now with a beautiful grandchild on your knee, age two. You'll be 196. <laughs> yes, Bob Dyer. Very, 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 very funny. Very, very good at the quiz shows. He could wind the, um, the audience up, and he could certainly get the... Uh, the contestants moving. Okay, so we're coming to the end now. So here's some uh, Australian shows from the 1950s. <coughs> Can you tell some of them are well? I'll put my glasses on. Sure. The most, you know, most important ones. Oh, the... You know, you don't read them. Okay. I can't read all them. <laughs> That's a poster I've got up in my office. So around about 1953 is when we started seeing the uh, U.S. shows come in. But you can see, if you can, if you can see on that um, on that poster, you'll see there's only probably about three or four U.S.-based shows there. The rest of them are all Australian. So 
So none of the you, you know, 26 hours, you'll recognise that one. Um, Dam busters, that's another one that's been in circulation. So is dress unknown, counterfeit, that's been in circulation. Brand of Justice, that was Western. There's old Bob Dyer copped a lot. Famous Trials is another one that's uh, in circulation. Inspector West, High Adventure. Hollywood Theatre. <coughs> Mobile Quest was a um, um, audience participation. Patrick Dawlish, another John Creasy based one. Life with Dexter, very funny series. Rocky Star. Western Trail, that one's up on my website at the moment, a couple of episodes in my uh, blog. Box 13, I think you'll recognise that. So here, here we are into, into some, of the, um, some of the US shows that slipped into the, into the uh, 50s and a little bit later. So we start off with Davy Crockett, Box 13. I Give and Bequeath, which is um, Strange Wills as well. Bold Venture. Chicken Man, anyone heard of Chicken Man? That's, that's still played on radio. Dragnet, Speed King, Night Beat. How could I do that? My friend Irma. Dangerous Assignment, there we go. Dragnet. At least these ones came in on um, through Grace, Grace Gibson and you get something like... Um, and these, these are transcriptions, these were Australian productions. These, these ones here, um, some Grace Gibson ones, these, a lot of these are the US transcriptions themselves. Stand By For Crime, that was a, that was Dangerous Interlude here. It's a funny story on that one. Do you remember, um, anyone know Dangerous Interlude? But do you know Stand By For Crime? Well, Dangerous Interlude and Stand By For Crime, I believe, are both the same thing. The, uh, Grace Gibson was actually in a, in a um, group of about uh, four other producers here in the US and uh, they did this Dangerous Interlude and it doesn't, wasn't doing very well. Glenn Langan was, was involved. Um, they did. It was supposed to be 52 episodes, they did 26 um, and then it got pulled. So Grace brought Glenn Langan and, and, um, and those 26 episodes to Australia and then she did the other um, episode 27 to, to 52 in Australia. Uh, her staff absolutely didn't want to do the series, didn't like it, didn't like the way it was written. She wouldn't allow, she's very, very American. She wouldn't allow the Australians to rewrite that particular series at all. Um, and uh, yeah, they got pretty upset about it. Um, uh, the, um, the script writer, in fact, said, look, it's so bad that, that uh, the guy gets murdered twice in one episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she still wouldn't let him rewrite it. So you'll see uh, Stand By For Crime, you know, there's 26 episodes floating around, but uh, there's actually 52 in the, in the series. And Dangerous Interlude is, is one of the names it's known by. Um, and yeah, I, I still have to sort out that series and how it all came about. I know, that, I know the story and all the rest of it. But Res James, my, my mentor at, at Grace Gibson Productions, he just didn't want to talk about it. It was just one, one series he wouldn't talk about. They, the staff absolutely hated it. And um, yeah, it was very hard to get details out of it. So um, OK, we come to the end. Um, so I've got to thank a few people. The main one being my research partner, Morris um, Steyer. Morris has, has passed away, um, but he's the guy that got re really started on, on doing the documenting and all the rest of it. And between he and I, we've, we documented over 6,000 Australian-produced um, series and serials. 
um, in, in our database, and this is the database that I refer to any every time I get an email from, from the US saying, hey, uh, what's, um, what about this series? Is it American? Is it Australian? And I go straight to the database, and if it's not in there, I know it was American. Um, it's very easy with the American stuff is because I know to look before 1940, if it was non before 1940, I, I know, um, and certainly if it's before 35, I know it came over in a, a, on, on transcription. If it was between you know, 35 and, and, um, and, and 40, um, uh, I know where to look for that. In the 40s, we started doing scripts, so it's, chances are it's an, it's an Australian version of the US show. And then we just start importing the US transcriptions till around about 1953. So I've sort of got those, those dates down pat, so I know where to go looking for, for information. It's very, very hard when you, when you go through the program, guys, and you, all you've got, you've got no description, you've just got the name. And sometimes it throws people, because everyone keeps asking about, I love a mystery. Well, yes, we had I love a mystery in Australia, but it had absolutely nothing to do with the American series. But people, people will do a, a newspaper search and they'll say, oh, I love a mystery, oh, and they'll email me and say, is there any episodes that survive? You know, can we get that? Can we get that? It's a totally different series from what you guys are used to. It's like Gunsmoke. You know, the first um, the first Gunsmoke was actually Gun Smoke, and it was done by a guy who who was an Olympic uh, shooter, and and he had this this shooting show on on radio, um, and that throws people out as well. Um, but you know, it's just one of those things. Um, yeah, Reg James, unfortunately we've just lost Reg. Um, he was with Grace Gibson from, from Office Boy 1946 through to, um, through to um, well after Grace passed away, he, he was the manager of, of Grace Gibson Productions. Um, and so Reg was always wanted somebody to pass the information on to and I got adopted um, in that regard. Uh, Bruce Ferrier, who gave me permissions to use some of his, um, his shows on here and, and the audio of, of Grace. Um, the Trove Project, I use a lot, and, and you guys could probably use that one too. It's just, it's, um, it's the newspaper um, uh, digitisation project from the National Library of Australia. It's about the only thing you can find online um, that's, that's a useful tool for researching OTR, is you can go in along there and, and, um, and uh, put in the name of a series that you're looking for, or an actor you're looking for, and all this, and, and um, pull up all the, all the um, newspaper reports on it. Um, Jamie Kelly, um, a lot of people know Jamie, he's a collector in Australia and uh, very few people know Craig Nugent and that's the way he likes it. Um, but those, those two guys keep, keep uh, if, I, if I'm looking for a show, someone contacts me and says, oh, is any of this survive? You know, if I don't have it in my collection, you know, they're, they're the two guys I email first up. They're also the guys I go to when, uh, when we're trying to pick a voice. Uh, the cast, um, they both know them well. Craig is also excellent at things like um, what music was used. Um, it, it, he'll go straight down to, he'll tell me what disc library it belonged to and what track was used and, 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 and all the rest of it. He's right, right into that. Um, and, and of course, there's the guys over here who, who research stuff for me as well and, and keep in touch with them. They, they know who they are. Um, and of course, my wife who did up this um, this um, slideshow that I kept mucking up because I've never used it before. I've been in computers since since Commodore 60, uh, Commodore no, be Vic 20 days, but I've never done a PowerPoint before. I've never had to. Usually, when I do when I do talks, I go out to uh, I go out to a nursing home or or to um, a museum or something like that, and I'm usually just I just talk off the cuff. I just can't talk off the cuff anymore. But that's basically it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Are there any questions? I don't think we're holding anybody up because that's, that's why they left me to last. I have a question. Yes. Um, there's a there's a there's a thing called copyright. Um, and, and it's very, it's very fierce. <laughs> it's very fierce in Australia. Um, so yes, I do put them up when I can. If I'm, 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 very, I'm months and months and months behind on blogging, uh, but you know, because I've been getting ready to do this and all the rest. But there'll be more going up on my blog 
but if you if you jump on my blog, you, you'll find that I'll throw some episodes up there from time to time, and I get permissions from the copyright owners to to do that. There's only one there's only one production house in Australia who says no, um, and um, so you know, I, don't, I don't put their stuff up, um, or I might forget to ask them. Um, but the rest of them is pretty right. If I if I uh, ask Bruce, and he's he's very supportive, and he'll uh, allow me to put things up there. Um, so yeah, keep looking at the website. I've got my business cards for the website at the front here. If you wanna, if you wanna grab that. Um, sorry. It's just www.australianotr.com.au. Yeah, straightforward. Yeah. At the very beginning, you said that there was a, a tax video owners. Yeah. How did they know? <laughs> They had they had little vans going around, same as same as they did in England. Yeah, they they could they could see that you've got an aerial up, or, or um, um, in the in the case of television. But they used to used to be able to tell what was going on, and, and I guess I guess they had people that dob you in, or you know dob you in. That's an Australian term, isn't it? Uh, people who would tell on you. Um, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't live then, but yeah, like. We got married in what 79, so we never had to have a license, did we, Dawn? <laughs> so I never experienced it. And when I went through, you know, after my parents passed away, and I went through, went through all, all their material and all this, but they kept all sorts of stuff, but no licenses. Um, though I do the ones that were on there, I, I do have some in my collection. But yeah, they they did, and they everyone paid. I don't know whether they, I, I think I think they do. Yeah, that's that's how the BBC gets their money. And we, we might have to bring it back in Australia just so we can keep keep the ABC. Yes. In terms of coverage, what you know, a station would go from one district to another. How you know what was the coverage area? What hours? Thousand watching carriers so far. Absolutely no idea. Um, you know, you got. Basically, in your, in your towns and your, your cities, they usually gave them coverage to, to get out there into the in, into the, the area around there. Uh, like where I am is a regional area, and there was three main stations there, um, and they covered the whole town plus the region outside. Anything going beyond that then became the responsibility of the ABC to make sure that they got a signal, um, and the AB, that being the, the public one, that's what they their money was to. Uh, to make sure that everyone got coverage, um, but I, I, I really don't know a lot about radios themselves and and um, and, and the sort of coverage they give. I'm sorry. Yeah. Are there any shows through Australian produced that you think would be interesting to U.S. collectors that we should be looking at? Well, that, that was why I threw in these ones here today, is because everybody everybody emails me about the Shadow, um, Witch's Tale. Um, and I love a mystery, uh, those sort of things. But there are so many shows where, as I say, all these American actors came out to do stage shows and, and things like that, and then they starred in something, you know, in in the local area, um, like especially Sydney and Melbourne. Um, while they're there, they 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 do some stuff. Is there stuff that's that? I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff. There really is. There's so much, that, and and, and uh, in everyone's different. Diff everyone loves different genres, but. But um, I would love to get my hands on that enemy within, which is all about all about spies and all the rest of it. Uh, there's a group of us involved at the moment tracking down a series called Spy Exchange, which was a part of of um, uh, or a chapter of a, of a series um, called uh, what was it called, Carl? Um, the Black Stories of the Black Chamber. Yeah, yeah, which doesn't survive in the U.S. at all. And um, I found I. I found a, a, an article about this spy exchange uh, in a uh, trade magazine um, saying how Jack Arthur was in Australia doing some shows and um, he decided to go back to the US and they, or he decided, they decided they would make this series and he trotted off, off back to America with, with the whole lot under his arm and um, we've never heard anything more about it. He was, he was with WOR at the time um, but we don't know what happened to the shows. However. Um, three episodes, or no, four episodes survive in Australia. 
None Survive in the US of the US version. And there's a few series like that where some episodes survive in Australia. But there's nothing like the Archers of Paul Temple or something from the BBC that... Yeah. Well, Paul, Paul Temple, there, there's Australian versions of Paul Temple. There's Australian versions of uh, Dick Barton. In fact, the, the, most of the, the episodes that survive are the Australian episodes as far as um, uh, Dick Barton goes. So, and yeah, all those genres are there. John Creasy stories like The Toff, The Baron, um, uh, all, all those sort of ones based on his books. Yeah, they're all, they all survive in Australia. Not complete in all cases. I, I, I would estimate more than 90% of Australian uh, production has been lost. But we're talking something like about, there must have been around about 600,000 shows that were produced. Hmm. Just there was more yeah. Yes, Sammy. I wanted to ask specifically about the big part. Yep. The shows that are coming out on CD from the National uh, Sound Archive, do you well, believe those are Australian productions? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Because I, I have read that they are BBC productions that were shipped to Australia, and that just happens to be where the discs ended. That's one of the things. No, what, the, what they did was actually send out a couple of couple of discs of the um, of the English version um, and then the <coughs> Australia and all the details and all the rest of it but no they were done in Australia there's a there's an excellent book on the serials uh, put out by um, I can't think of his gentleman's name uh, you can ask me about it you know, I'll, I'll get the details for you where he, he's he's logged the whole lot and he's the fellow who's responsible for those CD releases uh, but no they are the Australian um, cast and yeah, you, you, it's very hard to pick. And we are supplying, we, as collectors in Australia, we have been supporting that project um, with the episodes um, to try and get them back out there and, and heard. What about uh, Paul Temple? Did you hear the Australian I've never heard it. Um, there are some episodes that survive. Um, whether we'll hear, we just have to keep watching this space. Um, I hope so. Uh, and, and if the BBC can get interested in, in doing something there, we might be able to uh, you know, put our heads together and come up with some episodes and, and get them over to them. But at least now they've, ma they've made contact with us. There's a few things that they just they thought were lost. And I read the serial book and the guy said, I know episodes survive of this. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I've got one. And, and sent it over to them and, and they couldn't believe it. And then they, they even emailed me and said, hey, is it, we're doing a display at the British Museum. Is it OK if we, if we use your episode? I'm saying, yeah, no problem. So now they know to contact us, because we try and do what we can to help them. Right, yeah. Oh, one, one last one. Well, how many local stations were, they, were there versus how many of them were on networks? They're all pretty much tied into a network of some sort. But you could you could belong to more than one network too. Okay, so so you had your, you had your networks. They had a major station in say Sydney and Brisbane and, and and Melbourne, and then all the little regional guys were able to loosely join in there. But as I said, back in in 38, 39, there was 96 stations, um, and they were all involved in in a network of some sort. Uh, because you know, the stations that were not network were the ones that would have to depend on using transcriptions, whereas the networks, I assume, were not like here in the United States, and your networks did play trans, uh, transcribed programs. What, what, what is the percentage, you think, of, of programs that were recorded for broadcast versus those that were done live and may have been recorded? Uh, well, <laughs> no way of knowing. No way of knowing. I, I've never looked into it, but I will. It's something I'll, I'll, I'll be looking into further. Because I learned so much just doing this for this talk, and, and it's sort of it's something that I've been concentrating on, simply doing the numbers of, of um, the Australian shows and, and things like that. I haven't sort of gone into that wider area at all. And because I've been doing it basically all on my own uh, for the last 18 years, apart from, from Morris until he passed away there about three or four years ago, we just, it's just us doing it with occasional help from, from Jamie or, or Craig or someone. Yeah. So we've got a lot of work to do. And and you've got to go to the state libraries to get the information and, and things like that. It's very hard. 
Thank you very much. Is anyone still here interested in BBC stuff? We're going to start in a second. Um, I'm going to sit there and talk. But uh, before we start, I just want to come over here and show you these characters because this isn't everything that Dawes did. But he was the voice of Super Snooper, Blabber Mouse, Quick Draw McGraw, Baba Louie, Pokey Wolf, Pix, uh, uh, Dixie, and then uh, Mr. Jinx, Pilots, uh, Wild Gator, Snoopy Loop, Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, there's Elroy. Uh, there's a few missing talk about him like uh, Henry Orbit. And now you're not going to see me anymore. You're just going to hear me. Because <laughs> you want to look at that. So um, welcome. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you. you all, thank, thank you. Thank you. You all know who Doss Butler was. Now, it's interesting because even his wife, Murtis, called him Dawes. But his actual name is Dawson, Charles Dawson Butler. So it's actually pronounced, and he preferred that you pronounce it Doss. Doss Butler. No one ever said it that way, hardly ever. I just read his, the bio, bio that I did of him, which you can see the cover there. And that's a picture from the book of him as a child. Uh, that's the cover of the book. and. Uh, it, uh, it has his entire story from uh, his childhood all the way up till his uh, passing away in 1987, as well as uh, a lot of inside stories, some of which I'll tell you now, about how he created these characters and, and uh, how uh, deeply he was involved in the personality and the, uh, the invention of these characters. In retrospect, I feel that it should have been called Hanna-Barbera Butler because without Doss Butler, those characters would not have the life that they had. He did things that other people didn't do. He, he did what he called interpolation, which meant that if there was a line in the script and it was Snagglepuss, and Snagglepuss was supposed to say, I disagree, I disagree. He'd say, I beg to differ, I'm a differ beggar. You know, and that's Doss making that up on the spot so he was the kind of actor who brought more to it than just acting. And he didn't get the credit that he deserved. Hopefully now he will. That's the card that he used to send to fans uh, in the 70s and 80s. And uh, he autographed them. I have one at home that has my name on it as well. But uh, it shows some of the other characters, like he was the son in the Raisin Bran commercials, and uh, Lamsey, and It's the Wolf. You know, he was Cap Captain Skyhook, which was basically a Charles Lawton voice. Captain Skyhook! He was a Charles Lawton, you know. Um, but we're going to go through, and you're gonna, you're, I'm going to demonstrate some of the characters. That's the back of, uh, of a different uh, cartoon card that he used to send out that he signed to me. And uh, these are pictures from the book.